It's time to do the show. It's Pat and Britt shooting the shit. It's time to go. It's Soy Trek. You and me. You and everybody. We're going to space. We're going to race to talk about Trek. Welcome to the show. There we go. That's a nice song. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. I just uh, made that off the dome. That was a freestyle is what they call it in the uh, the my world. It's freestyle. <laughs> and that was a battle rap. Now now you have to respond hmm. with the battle rap in kind. Then we're going to we're going to do the 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 Drake and Kendrick of Star Trek podcasts. You've been following this it took Drake me a while and Kendrick. To out what, uh, I've been following it somewhat like uh Took me a while to get uh, acclimated because I know some things about Drake. I think I even know less about Kendrick. Right. And so I was cu- getting caught up on all of that that was happening. And I'm like, hmm, okay. But I mean, it makes sense. I mean, I think Drake has like been dealing with those sort of like accusations for quite some time. I mean, it wasn't too long ago where, yeah, he did have some sort of weird correspondence with. Um, uh, the Stranger Things girl, Millie Bobby Brown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's yeah. and uh, on his latest track, it's really interesting. Uh, on all the other tracks, like Kendrick just like calls him like a pedophile and like kind of suggests. I listen that, to that song. It's really good. It's really fucking funny. <laughs> it's it's actually a really good song. Yeah, I love the the part yeah. where it's like trying to strike a chord and then I bet it's A minor and then they play an <laughs> A minor chord and I'm like shit. He's on he's on that fucking crazy jazz shit. He's like <laughs> like that that song slaps though. It's like undeniably catchy. The beat goes really hard. Uh like yeah. and someone on Twitter was like he made, uh, Kendrick made like a diss track that's a like a, a certified club banger. They're gonna play it on the NBA Finals, and like the very next day, TNT played it during the NBA. <laughs> Which oh my is, god! It, it's like I think maybe the first time ever a diss track has charted at, at number one on both the um, the Billboard charts and Spotify. Hmm, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, then again, you could look at every Fleetwood Mac song as a diss track. That's true. Um, but I mean, <laughs> it's like, it's weird because the people getting dissed are like singing the lyrics. Yeah, exactly. Doing backup yeah. harmonies <laughs> on it and shit. Like, it's it's crazy. Ima- imagine doing that. Like, someone hands you a sheet of paper and you're like, wait, is this about me? And they're like, yeah, fucking sing it. The key is G minor. <laughs> fucking go. And you're like, what? Is what? <laughs> I guess the same was, it can also be said about No Doubt when, like, I think... Oh, yeah, like, the, the said, bassist like, in the in mm-hmm. Gwen Stefani, I think, broke up. and Yeah, like, every single song was about him and how he cheated on her or something. So. That's wild. <laughs> and all those songs did really well, too. So, yeah, I mean, I guess this isn't technically the first diss track, but I guess it's, like, not one where the, the uh, subject is actually involved in the making of the song as well <laughs> yeah absolutely 
it's uh it's 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 pretty wild you know it's uh we live in a wild world and i'm glad drake's getting called out on his shit uh i don't think it's going to end his career or anything because he has a pop fan base and they don't give a fuck about any of that no i mean i think like i mean people still walk up not normal people still walk up to kanye and get pictures <laughs> and kanye True. basically was normal like people praising hitler so <laughs> so uh, i think uh, i think um I think uh, Drake's pretty going to be in this. Be fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I think so too. But I mean, you know, Kanye has like definitely speared his career. I mean, he's still like yeah. a notable public figure, and he's still rich. But mm-hmm. um, you know, he's definitely like no one's paying attention to him. He tried to weigh in. He uh, on the the Drake and Kendrick controversy, and like put a line in his song about like having. Kendrick's back and nobody cared. Nobody paid any attention to it. <laughs> oh, good for him. Yeah, totally. <laughs> um, yeah, so what's going on with you? You know. I don't. Did you know that we have scenic, a page? Uh, scenic Ohio. <laughs> scenic Ohio. Oh, yeah. You uh, you taken in the scenic, uh, what do they call it, meth? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's very scenic. Like, the sights and sounds. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we have a Patreon. I do. Yeah, yeah. If uh, you'd like to support us on our show, please go over to patreon.com. And uh, it's patreon.com slash dumbidiotbs is where we're at. And, uh, you know, help support us. There's a bunch of tiers there. Mm-hmm. You uh, get a bunch of different things for as little as free. You can sign up. Uh, but uh, we, sup- you know, we we appreciate it when you support us for as little as two dollars a month, and with that, you get uh, such things as all of our episodes in high quality when they first come out, access to a private Discord. Um, uh, let's see what else. A uh, bunch of back episodes. Uh, all of your episodes for all of our shows are in one place, and we got a bunch of shows. You know, we got Soy Trek, of course. We've got prison breakdown a podcast about prisons we've got the media dungeon we've got dumb idiot bs we've got my wife we've got um getting hit a bucket cast you know we've got all types of stuff for all sorts of different interests um for uh, as little as five dollars a month uh we shout out your name and say thank you to people just like dylan lance jordan hale elizabeth hearn nick savard shane sawyer David Craning Sites, Electric Baphomet, Gursky, Jormore, Kyle Simmons, Gillian McCrary, SFC Punk, Seven of Nine, D. Riker, Ethan Adams, James Hartman, Iggy, Abigail Simpson, Shane Williams, Sam Mayo, Seb, Robert Yolito, Asher Pliskin, Skeptic, Papa Poison, Awful Star Trek Drawings, which is a wonderful Instagram account. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jose Martinez, Nova, Gabe Siciliano, A Big Strong Boy, Vinny, Luna Dahlia, Former Twink, Nathan G, David James Robinson, Phil McCavity, Danny, Latch Finial, and our good friends over at Hate Speech Podcast, the Bruce Campbell Podcast, and the Anamorphin Time Podcast. Hells yeah. Yeah, uh, and then for $10 a month, you can get access to The Media Dungeon, which is a uh, media server that I have. It's got over uh, 19,000 films. It's got over 1,700 shows now. Uh, it is more media than you will find anywhere else. I guarantee you, anywhere else. I'm uh, I'm approaching. Uh, it at this point, I've got uh, about as many films as every single streaming service put together. And when I say every single streaming service, I mean like every single major streaming service, except for unless you count the movies you can buy on Amazon. Because Amazon, you can buy up to 34,000 films, but they only Mm -hmm. have usually a couple thousand in rotation for free. But uh, I've got 19,000 films, which, I mean, Netflix has like 3,000 films. Hulu has a couple thousand. Disney has like 800 
you know, Paramount has a few hundred, you know, they, um, they've all got their rights, but I don't care about their, their media rights. So you help me pay for my server and I give you access to it. You know, you're, you're paying for the hard drive space to help me maintain that and shit. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, and then for $20 a month, you get merch every single month or actually sometimes I'll combine two months in a row and just send you out like a bunch of stuff. Like I recently sent out, uh, for, for two months, it was a pack with two t-shirts, a pack of buttons and two, uh, koozies, like all that together Hmm. would usually cost, you know, on the website, like, uh, 60, 70 bucks after shipping. But you know that's that's only forty bucks to get that on the Patreon, which is a pretty 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 good deal, I think. You know? Yeah. 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 Get it? Get the whole ass wardrobe. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> once again, that's patreoncom slash bs patreoncom slash bs to to help support us, and we really appreciate everything. Thank you so much to all of our supporters. You uh, help keep us editorially independent and ad-free. And we like that. I think everyone likes that. So, it's time to talk about some motherfucking Star Trek, right? Yeah. Yeah, we watched... Uh, ep- Got some discoveries. Uh, was it episode six? Episode six of season five. Uh, it's called Whistle yeah. Speak. It's the name of the episode. Uh, this Which ep- was kind of let down. There was no whistle song. There uh, there was whistle speaking in it. You know, there was, there was some whistling, but yeah. they, didn't, they didn't do a song. That'd be cool. Yeah, like... Uh, you know, you put your lips together and you, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I hate, I hate, don't worry, be happy. That's like my least favorite song. Bobby Darren, <laughs> immensely, immensely talented. Bobby Darren, Bobby, what's his name? Mm. I forget, but he's an immensely talented individual, but I fucking hate that song so much. <laughs> anyway, uh, whistle speak, uh, discovery season five, episode six, uh, was released on the 2nd of May, 2024. Uh, it's the 61st episode of Discovery and the 914th episode of Star Trek overall. This one was written by two people, Kenneth Lynn, who has done three episodes of Discovery, including The Sanctuary and There is a Tide from Season 3. And Brandon Schultz also co-wrote, uh, and he worked his way up from staff writer to executive story editor since season two of Discovery, and has written four episodes, including Perpetual Infinity from season two, The Sanctuary from season three, along with Kenneth Lynn, and Stormy Weather uh, from season four. This one was directed by Chris Byrne. Uh, Chris Byrne has directed five episodes of Discovery, including Into the Forest I Go from Season 1, Choose to Live from Season 4, and also did an episode of Strange New Worlds, the episode All Those Who Wander. Hmm. Yeah, so we've got some uh, experienced people on this episode. Let's dive right in. So we open on Burnham, Tilly, and Stamets, and they're testing the clue from the end of the last episode. And it's like just a tube of water. They haven't been able to figure it out for two days, and it seems just like pure distilled water inside a tube. Burnham suggests if they can't use chemistry to use history and anthropology and find a planet where distilled water might have had some significance. Burnham warps away to the Infinity Room. In the Infinity Room, Kovich tells Burnham that the USS Lock, Locker is pursuing Maul and Locke while they figure out the clue. Kovich says it stands to reason the identity of the clue's creator might come in handy and gives her a paper list of names of the clue's creators. And he makes a big deal about how it's like a 21st century legal pad. Yeah. It's super weird. He's like, oh, you can't, you can't be paper. I still prefer a paper list. Like he, like he wasn't born into a world that knew paper. How did he find out about paper? Yeah, was it ever like actually established that he's like a um, hologram or something? I, I was know. getting that kind of sense from him. Is he? I don't. I don't know. Because like, yeah, like this obsession with like real stuff and 
Like he's just a hipster. Yeah, just yeah, I guess like the worst kind of hipster where he's just like obsessed with like with authenticity and shit. And... Yeah, and also of of really minor <laughs> and inconsequential things like legal pads and glasses. Yeah, yeah, things that like <laughs> make your life like inconvenient, but like they're it's a stylistic and aesthetic choice. You know, yeah. like the guys who bring like a typewriter into a cafe. Yeah, and it's like clear that he wanted to be applauded for using a legal pad. Like, check this out. It's a legal pad. Mm-hmm. Real. 21st yeah. century. And it's it like like like, oh. sh- like she would know. She's from what? The 23rd century? Like like would she yeah. even know what a legal pad is? Like or even care? Like yeah. <laughs> it's just like it's just like okay. Well, yeah. yeah, it's like the guys who are just like, yes, I'm really into antique typewriters or something. <laughs> right. Yeah, th- this guy fucking, he's like taking a dump and it's like a uh, sonic bidet on. Oh, he's like, no, no, no. I prefer the analog way and gets out toilet paper and just sp- smears <laughs> shit all over his ass. He uses the three seashells. <laughs> <laughs> this is, yeah, uh, I've been waiting for them to bring back the three seashells. It's supposedly we should have it now. Yeah, I mean, you know, the Bell Riots happen in Star Trek, which mm. make Taco Bell the only restaurant. We know that. Mm-hmm. So we know that, you know, we, we've got in-universe connections already. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So over with Dr. Culver, he's speaking to his grandmother, a uh, hologram of his grandmother, who is played by a woman nine years older than him. Uh, They bullshit, and he pauses the program. He tells the computer to tell the doctor who made the program that he says the program is very therapeutic, and the hollow of his grandma is exactly as he remembers her. Uh, They have a moment, and the grandma suggests that uh, Colbert is a man of science, and that he examine the body before he examines the soul, and he finds this, like, relevatory. He has an epiphany up in here kind of I, the, for this like this whole side story i think is kind of i don't know it feels kind of tacked on for me I mean, it's, I, it's I incredibly really tacked episode. on the b plot in this episode is a stinker yeah like uh, and it's been and they're trying to just dragging this on where it's just like this should be like something that should be resolved by the end of the episode <laughs> right like, you know whatever he's going through but it's just like okay he has to make a kind of um morbid um facsimile of his own grandmother <laughs> yeah. it was funny because i was just, i was just kind of wondering like wait uh, like it was like okay that ha- at first i thought like he was actually having a phone call with her at first or something so mm-hmm. i can't remember if he mentioned in previous episode whether or not she died or not. yeah yeah he he, he and, has um, and that's like been he's been having a lot of trauma about it yeah and and then i was like wait is this a phone call and then i'm like oh no wait it's um it's a uh and then i'm like oh then of course then i was like realized oh yeah she's she died a thousand years ago <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah yeah precisely <laughs> but, but like um um yeah it's just like kind of just weirdly morbid just having like um i mean they kind of covered this in like a black mirror episode where they made um the facsimile of like a woman like made like um a version of her dead husband with like uh that was and his personality was compiled from all of his social media posts and stuff and hmm. um and uh so she kind of and just how horrific that eventually becomes just having like this concert this like lit talking like thing that construct that provides the uh the simile of, of living with not actually <laughs> so like and so and just doesn't allow you to move on and here he is just like you know reviving his grandmother to have some sort of like bizarre philosophical uh, conversation with her but yeah it, and it, it, it's like half half the conversations about food and then like she like gets serious and like she's like i i raise you to be a man of science uh, mm-hmm. After he like tries to talk about spiritual stuff with her, but she doesn't want to talk about spiritual stuff because she's a uh, hologram, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, with Tilly Burnham and Stan, she's like, like, don't, don't kill me, don't turn me off, don't turn me off. <laughs> <laughs> I only exist when I'm on. No. Don't kill me, Colbert. Why? <laughs> don't send me? me back to the dark place, please, <laughs> grandson. <laughs> Um, I'm in hell. <laughs> she starts like de- rapidly decomposing in front of his face. 
Uh, <laughs> so with Tilly Burnham and Stamets, they theorize about Denoblian Nebula Towers, which say that five times fast, yeah. uh, with ultra-distilled water. They consider a planet with an atmosphere so toxic uh, that water has to be extracted on a molecular level, thus making it ultra-distilled like the water in the tube. Also, I, I, I hated the fact that, okay... We had to mention Denobulans, and we don't see a single Denobulan in this entire fucking episode. No, we don't. The, another we thing we don't seen, see in, in this entire... We haven't seen one since Prodigy. Like, there was, uh-huh. like, they included one in Prodigy. Mm-hmm. But, like, we're not going to... You're not going to... You're not going to give us, like, uh, another... At least a hollow call with, with like, a Denoblian or, like... I yeah. don't know. Like, like they talk about a Denoblian doctor who hid this, this clue, and they never show him. Mm-hmm. Like... No. Yeah, so, um, they whittle it down to a planet on a Denoblian trade route called Halemno, with a small habitable region with some humanoid life signs, pre-warp and pre-industrial. It seems the clue's creator created a lifeline for the civilization and hid it from them as to not violate the Prime Directive. Burnham decides to head to the surface with Tilly, so at least this isn't another book burn episode. Credits ten minutes in. Yeah, that that got that had me from the beginning. So I'm like, oh, thank God we're not just like doing like the same episode yet again. And right. I, I gotta say, like. This episode actually feels very TNG like. <laughs> honestly, honestly, it did. So the A plot is good. Like the A plot yeah, is like a good. quality plot. There's no like unnecessary fighting. There's not a nope. whole bunch of like wax and poetical on what the Federation means and shit like that. Mm-hmm. Um, like there is like you know. Uh, I mean, like, there is kind of. There is, like, but but she's just like technology, of, like, technology, 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 and the guy's like, yeah, go, we're go, 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 go. Yeah, yeah. And like, and the, and how like they should, you know, it's just like it's basically yeah, a classic like TNG um, pre warp civilization to, yeah. um, type episode, which is right. it was really good. Yeah, yeah. So so let's get into it. Um, after the credits. And once again, we have like a really long cold open. Credits don't come in until 10 minutes here because, you know, we've got a long cold open, plus we've got a last time on Discovery, which they do every time now. Mm -hmm. Which, I guess, whatever. So, uh, Burnham is looking at some stuff when Tilly comes in, and there's some whistling. And it's recordings of people helping each other when translated. And uh, these are the people of uh, Haremno. Burnham talks about linguistics and how you can learn so much from a civilization by how they speak to each other. She reviews their language and says they have no class structure inherent in the language and they have three gender identities recognized in their world and multiple words for pain. Tilly says they could really use Burnham at Starfleet Academy and they have a moment and then they beam down. Um, on the surface, Tilly and Burnham are in some crazy costumes that make them look like extras in the Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas. <laughs> they do. And, and I will, I will say like this, you know, keeping in with classic, like TNG episodes mm-hmm. with pre-warp civilizations, of course, like all of the people in this pre-warp civilization have perfect teeth, perfect skin and perfect hair, but they're dirty. But they're not even dirty. They're just yeah. wearing kind of like dirty, dirty, weird. Yeah, as you yeah said, they're, they're like, wearing dirty um, clothes. Outfits. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but they're very much like just like from from extras casting, like people who want to be like professional actors. So they're very clean cut, which is very classic Star Trek. Very classic Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> just, just like, oh, yeah, just like, yeah, these people have like yet to really like. They haven't invented combustion engines, but they but have they have three engineers. genders. They've got three yeah. genders, but they don't have an engine, which I like. Yeah, and they have but they have veneers and like um, <laughs> hair styling. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, on, uh, on the surface, Tilly and Burnham are in some crazy costumes, and uh, Tilly asks Burnham about leadership because she's struggling uh, with her students at Starfleet Academy, and suddenly they hear whistle speak. And uh, the whistlers talk in these really hacky poems. Uh, yeah. The conversation goes like this. We've come from afar. Let my voice call you home. We traveled from the dust. Come and rest, you must. We journeyed from the storms on the summit 
you'll be warm. Like what? <laughs> what? What? Like third grader wrote that, and then the writer was like, "No, no, I'll, 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 I'll figure out a way to get it in my show, kid." Like, <laughs> come on. So, wouldn't surprise me if it was written by AI. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> yeah, AI was. They were just like, "Yeah, hey, uh, Chat GTP, write a poem about whistling by, and by, uh, finding home." <laughs> by AI, do you mean an idiot? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So on Discovery, Book asks Colber for some help, and Colber tells him he needs to chill and get a hobby. Uh, uh, damn. Damn, dude. He's like, touch grass. And he's like, we're on a starship. Uh, so Colber goes to Stamets and asks for an assistant doing a neural scan on himself to record the effects of the Jantara uh, on a human that he did on Trill since there aren't many cases. And Stamets asks him if he's having after effects. Colbert isn't sure. Stamets agrees to scan him the next morning. And this was the only part of the B-plot that I was like, okay, I mean, it's a callback to a former episode, to something that was kind of important to this character. I totally, I'm, I'm totally into that, you know? Mm -hmm. But the rest of, like, the conclusions that they got from it were very dissatisfying and, like, the prelude to it where he's talking to his grandma or, like, what? Yeah. Yeah. So, on the planet, Tilly and Burnham find some wandering citizens heading towards the summit, uh, all of whom, I mean, some of whom are, like, clean, but some of whom are just, like, covered in dust. Um, oh, yeah. And they invite them to join their group, and they accept. Uh the old woman seems sickly and she says she got lost in the dry lands which is the uninhabitable area she says she does not fear the storms and was on the edge of one when she got lost in the dry lands burnham says they're from the east and they haven't been to the high summit before where there's a holy temple where only the chosen may enter Suddenly, a villager, uh, villager invites them, a young girl, uh, to come with her for hospitality. And the old woman isn't doing well. She, she be coughing. She be coughing and hacking like she just took a massive fucking bong <laughs> hit. She's like... <laughs> and uh, they're like, hey, uh, we need to, like, you know, get her, get her some medicine and stuff. So... They put her down. That's the real reason they leave, like, the comfort of their... Of their um of their uh, garden mm -hmm. <laughs> of Eden and, so and go into the gaseous, gaseous area. Mm -hmm. So the village comes together led by a doctor named Ovaz to heal her. A very handsome doctor. Uh, they use sounding bowls and make Burnham hallucinate and pass out. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know what's something I realize kind of like bums me out about Discovery? Mm -hmm. is no one just like hooks up with anyone on a planet like you you even have that in like uh in strange new worlds like um pike is hooked up with like women on planets and stuff and i think that's cool mm -hmm. but like no one like everyone in discovery is in like a committed relationships and won't have sex mm -hmm. with anyone unless they're like in a committed relationship uh, mm. I, I think the big exception for that was obviously, um, uh, what's her face? Um, Georgiou, Mirror Georgiou, especially. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, we, we don't, we don't have in the last couple seasons, like there's been no sexiness about the show at all, which is something that's, I kind of, I kind of feel that's like also like the direction this series has decided to take where it is very just sexless in a sense. Yeah, yeah, it's it's for the series feels like it's for like queer queer asexual couples. Mhm. Mm yeah. <laughs> uh so um Burnham awakes in a bed and Ovaz apologizes for not warning her about the intensity of the sounding bull cure. The village girl from earlier, uh, I think it's his daughter, Rava, says when her turn comes, she'll clear the dust faster than anyone else. So they're doing some cool world building here that we never get to see, but they talk about a lot about like it's because like they actually allow them to focus on other characters that aren't Book or Burnham. <laughs> right. I mean, there's still some focus on Burnham, but like much yeah. less than the other episodes of this season, which is nice. Yeah. So, um 
Uh, this girl says she'll clear the dust faster than anyone else, and Burnham says she desires to enter the temple and uh, where they think the uh, control panel is, but they don't tell them because that'd be breaking the prime directive. And Rava says all they have to do is complete the journey of the mother compere. It's a race and test of devotion. Ova says that they should leave, and Burnham makes the request to enter the competition. So they're like, yeah, you can do it. It's tomorrow morning. And apparently this thing only happens like once every like 10, 15, 20 years, and they'd show up like on the exact right day for it. <laughs> That's very coincidental. Very coincidental. Like, so uh, in the morning, Tilly and Burnham meet Rava, who is also competing. Ovaz uh, comes and talks to Rava, his daughter, who is wearing her dead mother's wristband, and he's pretty sad about the whole thing. Tilly tells Rava she has a student like her and empathizes with her dad. She's like, I can't imagine what it's like for a parent. And I'm, I think this is supposed to show like Tilly growing as a leader, like thinking, mm -hmm. thinking more about like her students as like kids, which maybe she shouldn't do. But that's my opinion. Um, yeah, I mean they're typically like a grown adults yeah, by the time yeah, they get right, to start right. academy. You, you can't think about them like your children. Like, come on, like they're your students. The, there's a specific type of relationship you have with a student that is not the type of relationship you have with a child. Yeah, because like part of their training has to deal with a lot with like self sacrifice and mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and and so it's just like. Yeah, I don't know if you want to be like teaching high school students to like sacrifice their lives to for the greater good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, upon discovery, Adira and Rainer say they did a historical regression of uh, weather patterns, and there might have been more towers in the past, all that failed. Uh, and they think that's what's happening to the high summit. The solve is fixing the power system with new components. Mm. And Burnham's like, well, one mission just became two. Which, I don't know, like, they could have used, like, it's a It's they don't send, like, another away team with um, environmental suits to go inspect the other locations. Because mm -hmm. they know, like, this pre-warp civilization can't... I mean, they venture out there very rarely. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, that's a prime opportunity to do more research yeah <laughs> you know especially if if you're if your intention is to look for where the controls are like what better way than going to so the other tower interrupted yeah, yeah 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 that's a great point yeah to figure out their <laughs> machinations and stuff yeah that's for sure yeah uh so with colburn stamets uh stamets tells hugh that there are no lasting effects from the jantara and Colbert is disappointed since Trill, he's felt more connected and attuned in a spiritual way. Stamets says what matters is that he's okay and the brain is complex and he should enjoy this. Colbert still looks concerned, which is an interesting kind of turn for Stamets because he's usually all about science and like doesn't really believe mm -hmm. in like the mystical or anything like that. But, no. you know, he's just like supporting his partner here, which I kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm okay with mm -hmm. that, I guess. But... But it's still kind of an unsatisfying conclusion because, like, I wanted more, like, an effect from the Jantar. I think that would have been interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but that's not it. So, down on the planet, Burnham talks to the old woman, uh, who is now healed and not so dusty and doesn't look so old at all anymore. Uh, she says, last time there was a journey, she ran, and she was young. So this apparently, as I said, happens, like, maybe every like 20 years or something like this which is very strange mm -hmm. um see she says she's thinking of her lost friend the old woman does and uh, the old woman waxes poetical on the grace of the gods and it does some interesting world building about their religion so Ovaz now gives a speech and uh he gives everybody like a sugar cube full of dust and some people run to get water and are instantly disqualified from the race. So I guess the race, if you drink water, you're disqualified. And that's a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So then a run begins, and everybody is dusty and coughing and jogging slowly. Burnham and Tilly are falling behind. 
Um, one thing I want to point out is apparently, actually, I don't know, like, uh, is, is it like a race? Like, does only, because apparently more than one person can finish at the same time. So I, I don't know if, like, you can just walk it and just wait for everyone else to drop out. It's weird that everyone is running, but okay. Yeah, well, it seemed like typically there is, I mean, there is, typically is one win- mm-hmm. winner, but, like, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll Tilly get to does that. something yeah, yeah, where she's so. able. So, yeah, Burnham, so I think yeah. that th- there were some special circumstances that allowed for there to be more than one. Mm-hmm. So uh, Burnham notices some moss that looks irradiated uh, while on the run and says the control panel must be near. Uh, she drops out and lets Tilly continue the race. Uh, I'm not sure that was the right call. I feel like Burnham definitely has more endurance and physical ability than Tilly. And Tilly is also good at, like, science, <laughs> like Burnham, so I think she should have taken this one. And Michael should have done the race, right? Uh, well, my, I mean, Michael's good at everything, so... Yeah, Michael is good at everything, but 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 that's the thing is Tilly is not known to like show like big tests of physical endurance. She's not fighting a whole lot and winning a ton of fights like Michael is, you know. So no, 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 no. So and also like Burnham also notices that there's some moss that has like evolved because of such strong radiation. And she's like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to go that near that panel and doesn't wear, like, any protective gear or anything, which is, uh, <laughs> I don't know, seems unwise. Seems kind of unwise. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, so Burnham drops out and drinks the water. Um, Tilly and Rafa are the only two left in the race now. Burnham finds the control panel hidden in a rock and asks Discovery how to fix it. Apparently, she'll need to rebuild the motherboard without shutting the whole system down. So, Tilly... Uh Yeah, I like that they're still using the term motherboard this far in the future. So, uh, Tilly and (laughs) Rava are at the end of the race and are given bowls of water to tempt them. And uh, they're, like, handed bowls of water and they're like, "You you must finish the end with temptation. So Rava spills her bowl, uh, which is an instant disqualification because you need, you can't finish with an empty bowl. So Tilly goes over and fills her bowl with some water so they can both finish the journey together. And I actually really liked this scene, like a lot. This was maybe the best scene in the entire episode. And I kind of didn't Mm -hmm. expect it to be, but it was like one of those things where it's, you know, just like figuring out a problem and how to like help someone uh, with, you know, mm-hmm. just something, a, a little clever something. So. Yeah. Yeah. So on Discovery, Rainer tells Adira that they've been second guessing themselves too much since the time bug thing, since they brought the time bug onto the ship and caused that whole incident. And uh, Rainer tells Adira to bring it home with finding the auxiliary power. She contacts Tilly, and she's already in the temple, but she doesn't see a control panel anywhere. It's soon made clear that winning the journey entitles you to be a human sacrifice to bring the rain. So it's like a rain sacrifice to the gods. Tilly tries to convince Ovaz to not kill them, but he starts a sequence where she's locked in with big rocks, and it's weird that this is, like, such a pre warp civilization because they figured out, like, a way to mechanize rocks to, like, close chambers and shit. It's, it's wild. Um, although I don't know if they figured that out or, uh, you know, that was just there when they got there. Uh, they can't get a transporter lock on Tilly, but they're still communicating with her and tell her... She's in a vacuum chamber that injects stuff into the air to bring the rain, in the process sucking out all the air of the room and suffocating them. Rava tells her she shouldn't be scared and she should be grateful because she's going to go be with the gods, which is some cult shit to tell someone. That is some cult shit. That is some cult (laughs) shit. Uh, Burnham tells them to beam her into the chamber so she can save Tilly. Uh, Rainer says that would be breaking the prime directive, but Burnham makes it in order. 
Well. Mm, so, in the chamber, Rava explains some ancient symbols uh, to Tilly representing the five summits and the only remaining one, which is the third one, which is the one where they're at. Uh, and mm-hmm. this is why they must sacrifice to show the gods that they are worthy of their gift of being the last remaining tower. Mm-hmm. So with Ovaz, who's right outside the chamber, he talks to his dead wife and tells her that he wanted to forbid his daughter from taking the journey and becoming a sacrifice. But then Burnham beams in and he's scared as fuck, uh, which he should be. I'd be scared as fuck, too, if something like that happened. Yeah, that was that was pretty wild, honestly. Like, I mean, she could she could have beamed in elsewhere, like away from him or something like, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, I guess they did. I don't even think he locked really locked himself out. They, they she couldn't have like been beamed outside of the structure. Um, I don't know. I I don't know if they really went into that, but uh, she didn't <laughs> want to get beamed into the chamber, so she said like beam me into the room next to it. Yeah. Um. So. Um. In the chamber, they're running out of air. Um, oh, actually, first Burnham tells uh, Ovaz that the technology brings the rain, and they're they're in a giant machine. So in the chamber, they're running out of air. Rava sings a song that her mother sang, and Burnham starts to sing it because she's listening to it uh, while communicating with Tilly. Ovaz mm-hmm. is bewildered again, and she explains technology again and tells him to keep the chamber open or to open up the chamber and free his daughter and Tilly. He asks if she's a god, and she explains technology yet once again. He opens the chamber, and Discovery beams down a med team who save the dying ladies. Vaz is once again very bewildered, which, you know, I would be too. Like, if you kept on beaming shit down and showing me new technologies over and over... That would like wreck my fucking mind. <laughs> like, like imagine that. Yeah, like I feel like they kind of go too far with like. Sh- I mean, then again, you know, it's not like you know Picard hasn't like brought brought people on actually onto the Enterprise and had them look out the window at their planet. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or, or you know, and, um, um first contact actually like you know <laughs> just basically tell uh Zephram Cochran everything mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's just like but it's still funny to see it's still going on yeah you know it's there's always some some wiggling of the prime directive here and there uh I don't I don't yeah. love it when it happens but it's like you know sometimes the captains like deems it necessary and they they're mm-hmm. able to justify it in their own minds and you know there there's bigger war crimes done than like a little breaking of the prime directive here or there yeah exactly so um later burnham is just showing ovaz all the technology and breaking all the directives Mm-hmm. <laughs> she explains how the Denoblians saved them and built the towers for them. So she's like revealing everything about this, not just like beaming in and like making him go, what the fuck is that? She's explaining everything. <laughs> yeah, just the, the, like there's could have been some things to like kind of leave to the imagination. But then again, maybe she's like has to tell him because they know that these towers need to be maintained and you know, yeah but i feel that should also be like something that you know since this was done by a warp capable civilization since they they only exist it should be up to it should be the responsibility of the federation to upkeep it secretly yeah <laughs> you know and yeah. not and because like they're the ones that are wholly responsible so it's like so already the the um, their entire civilization is based on is artificial. Mm-hmm. So I, I guess it kind of it has a sort of like almost like a prime directive loophole where, you know, they they actually need to kind of rely on the intervention of the people who made this whole made this completely possible. So right, but it, in that way, it should be the Denoblians' responsibility. Yeah, it should be the Denoblians. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. it does seem like this was like so like a like. But who knows? Even knows if they're still around or that's, what their situation yeah. is. Yeah, right. Yeah, I right. mean, they're, 
Yeah, but like, um, uh, yeah, but I guess it does fall under their jurisdiction of the Federation, but really just like, you know, being like, your whole civilization is a lie. There is no God. Yeah. <laughs> like that's, like, that's kind of dangerous to just like completely, um, uh, destabilize the faith systems and community structures yeah, of a civilization, their entire belief system right uh-huh. from the get go from right, right, right from right. the beginning, just because it, like you don't want Tilly to suffocate to death. Right. And and this has me thinking too, is like, they're giving Ovaz all this power. This, this language doesn't have any power structure inherent in it, but if you want to put a power structure inherent in anything, you give one guy who's already like basically like the high priest already has like responsibilities outsized to the rest of civilization. You're giving mm-hmm. him like the means of survival yeah. for this entire civilization. Like you're, you're going to create. He holds, the, he holds the keys to existence. He holds the actual truth. Right. Or uh, like he's. And, uh, yeah. This guy is going to come to power and cancel the third gender. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I never agreed with that. Yeah. There's only there's only two genders now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's kind of just like, and and then it does show like, you know, well, well, he got the got the dust out of that woman's lungs, so he's a good guy. We can trust him. Mm-hmm. And then not not like the fact that yeah, absolute power craps absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, just. You know, they're going to leave and then they're going to come back to like upkeep that tower and there's going to be like a like a slave cast. (laughs) (laughs) So it's just like, you know, they have no idea what 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 really the rib and that's kind of like why the prime directive exists in the first place is because they don't know how any sort of um, influence is going to affect how their society will progress. Mm -hmm. And yeah, like, you know, basically you know, taking any sort of mystery out of their existence and not allowing them to come to these truths themselves, you know, and instead like where they're at a very vulnerable state where the scale is going to be tipped either way. You yeah. just gave one guy way too much information. <laughs> true. True. Yeah. So I'm concerned about that. So yeah, Burnham tells, uh, of Oz that the high summit is failing, but it needs to be maintained and, uh, we'll show him how. He asks if there are no gods, and she says there is what he believes, but also the Federation. Yeah. Ovaz fears yeah. what will happen if Which they- is like, it's like, okay, you no, well, but then he's basically saying, like, okay, well, clearly my gods don't exist. Yeah, so... Outside of this planet. Right. My be, gods are... Because your beliefs like, were definitely wrong, which is why you came here in the first place, Michael, to prevent people from getting sacrificed, because he was so wrong-headed about what was actually happening. And in these people, these people from another planet don't worship my god. Right. So that shows that he's not some omniscient... Mm-hmm creature that right. that who is responsible for all life in the universe yeah these these people who like, have like such greater technology and explain can explain our way of life to us better than we can to ourselves yeah like mm-hmm. yeah um not not great so <laughs> don't worry your god still exists you know mm-hmm. just like with a wink <laughs> so um Ovaz fears what will happen if they reveal uh, these truths to the people and stop the sacrifices, but Burnham is confident it'll work out just fine. Okay, okay, Burnham, great. Like, uh, I appreciate your vote of confidence. I'm not so sure it'll work out that way. Um, But yeah. Yeah, that's just there for the viewer. Just be like, okay, we're sure that everything's going to be fine, you know. Mm -hmm. But... As we saw, like that's why I kind of I really like do like the first Strange New Worlds episode because it just shows how like yeah, how easily it is to wrongly influence a civilization. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, anything that you do can per, you know leaves an impact and and changes the course of their civilization in a very dramatic way. And for sure, I feel that doesn't handles that very well. And and you know that was something that was done. You know and season two of discovery <laughs> with it the, and then that they had time to marinate on it and so we don't know i mean that I mean, unless like this planet is revisited in a future star trek franchise like it's obviously like discovery's ending the season so mm-hmm. we won't know how what 
awful ramifications. I doubt they'll happen. ever. They will never come back here. I guarantee you. No. Haramno uh, is dead to the Star Trek universe from now on. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> um, Culver comes over and says that Rava is stable and will live. So. Burnham and Tilly talk about how much paperwork uh, Burnham's going to have to fill out for breaking the Prime Directive, but Tilly lifts the mood by pointing out a symbol that was the clue uh, that was on the clue from, and it's one of the symbols for the dead towers for the planet. So she deduces they need to go to Tower Number Five, and that's where the clue is at. So Rava mm. wakes up and thinks she's dead, and when she finds out that she's not, she thinks her dad defied the gods. But Ovaz says that they need to listen when the gods tell them something new. The rain Yeah, how do they know that like they're gonna step out there and they're and, and that, that will be what their the rest of their their understanding is it's like mm-hmm. He defied the gods. He didn't sacrifice, you know. He didn't do the proper sacrifice, and then they're just going to, like, behead him and put his head on. But then again, we saw that they have a very, like... You know, they have a... a, The structure of their their society is very, you know, Mm non-competitive. Egalitarian. Very free. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, egalitarian. So it's just, like... So it doesn't seem like there's that underlying, like... Um, violence in their society, but you never know. You defy the gods. Who knows? <laughs> you never know. Yeah. Um. So, on Discovery, Book is playing like a virtual boy. I guess it's like a video game. I, that, I said the same thing. I was like, yeah. "Is that virtual boy?" <laughs> yeah, it's 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 like a fucking laser video game, and it looks like shit. Absolute fucking shit. Uh, and he's like on a, a ship doing it, and uh, instead of a holodeck simulator, because he says he can always tell it's not a real ship. Which can you? N- okay, book. Yeah, you, can you not tell that this isn't like a real ship that's flying? <laughs> like, come on. That's a, that's also just such a cool guy thing to say. Like, oh, you know. Yeah, such like, a hipster uh, thing. Yeah, fucking. <laughs> it's not authentic. I can always man. tell, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Colbert brings something his grandma used to make and they eat it together. Uh, Book says it's tasty. Colbert says he doesn't get tired of having all the answers. He says he's having a spiritual awakening, awakening ever since the Jantara and he's been woke as fuck since then. He tells Stamets, uh, he says he told Stamets, but he doesn't understand. Book says that's what, that's uh, what, like, Colbert is becoming kind of insufferable this season. He is, where just where he's just like is walking around. He just says that stuff where he's like, I don't have all. He's know, he, he's a fu- I, I, even I don't have all the answers. He's a and fucking like, first year Buddhist, is what he is in yeah. this season. He's like, oh no, I I, I meditate all, I meditate all the time. I've seen I've seen the light, and um, it's okay yeah. if you're not as you know awoken to your chakra as I am. But uh, yeah, he's they really turned him into the most obnoxious kind of guy, which is like, yeah, first first year psych student and first year first uh, you know guy who just Buddhist. joins the cult. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's just like it's like I wish he would just shut up. Yeah, but it seems like he's reached like the cusp of where his whole this whole storyline is going. So I'm mm-hmm. hoping like we can just put that. And I mean, and I think they do this on purpose and be like, oh, geez, bring back Bookburn. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So Book says it's not any less meaningful if it's just for yourself, mm. which I actually I kind of like. I like that sentiment. Uh, so Book talks about Burnham and Colbert asks if he misses what they had and if he can get it back. But Book deflects. Uh, so they're teasing more of, you know, more Booker and Burnham, which is, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, like that was that was that was telegraph from a million miles away. It's just like that's yeah. no surprise. Yeah, because they have to have like very committed monogamous relationships in this show for some reason. Yeah, that's and why it, like they should have done like the yeah let let a deer and gray do their thing. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like who cares? Yeah, <laughs> just right. like it's like last season. Go for it. Go weird. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get some orgies on board, baby. Yeah. We did flocks. Flocks almost, it would seem out of place in this sort of. Oh, flocks would be (laughs) totally out of place. He'd be like, (laughs) uh, Mr. Cleveland Booker, uh, uh, would you, would you, uh, do me a favor and, uh, fuck my wife? And (laughs) Booker would be like, uh, 
and that was and that was like post 9-11 bush era like come on star trek do better yeah come on <laughs> it's like it's like don't, you don't want to be outdone by be post 9-11 bush <laughs> right so uh over with tilly and burnham they found clue five and it had a betazoid inscription included which like i'm kind of bummed that they didn't show them actually like finding the clue they could have like cut the whole colber storyline and and had this had them actually finding the clue because instead they're just like oh a symbol means we need to go to tower five and then suddenly they just have the clue from tower five like it was they they walked in and it was right there and they just picked it up and left like how 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 do they find it they, they found a symbol that said that's the tower they need to go to these towers are big ass places you know mm-hmm. i don't know it would have been interesting if like um they had it where this this pre-warp civilization had actually found the clue and it became a central part of their whole entire belief system. And then they had to, <laughs> then they had that, to steal that would be it. interesting. Yeah, right, right. That like would, it's the like they would yeah. have been like, oh, we really need that. Oh my god. And you know what would be a great moral tale or moral quandary is like if the clue was like what powered their civilization. <laughs> yeah. And like if they took it away, it would like destroy their civilization, but they need it. Yeah. Yeah, they would have just gotten around that by having Maul and Locke take it or something. Oh, right, you know, right, true, like, true. Oh, Maul and Locke, but I guess we'll benefit from it, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It'll we'll steal it back from them. But, yeah, that would have that would have been funny. Which, which actually, they, I think, might have been a better setup if they wanted to tell this story this way, is if Maul and Locke were always one step ahead of them and getting the clues, and Discovery was showing up to try to find the clues, but realizing they're too late, and then having to help the civilizations who are left like destructed in the wake of Maul and Locke taking the clues. That's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, because instead it's like, yeah, because really Discovery has gotten every single one of these clues so far. Right. Have, which I'm guessing, like, of course, like it's going to have it where they're going to Maul and Locke are eventually going to steal it, steal it from them at some mm-hmm. point. But yeah, well, yeah. I we'll mean, see. we've only got four episodes left, so it's probably going to be the next episode if that happens. Yeah. So, um, Tilly asks what the clues creator was trying to tell them, hiding the clue there. Burnham thinks it was a lesson about being careful with technology. But how did they know that, like this? I don't know. This civilization wouldn't have done anything in like the eight hundred years since then. Or that, mm-hmm. like, yeah, they wouldn't have found warp technology or been visited by the Federation or anything like that. Like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird to try to, like, yeah, give that give that lesson. Been assimilated by the Borg. <laughs> right. So, um, suddenly Burnham gets a call from the bridge. Maul and Locke have been found. Discovery warps to investigate. End of episode. End of now episode. He's yeah, uh, what do you think? I mean, it was I. I was actually I actually really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, yeah, as we said, like there was no karate. Uh, it actually had like a sort of like classic sort of Star Trek style story that wasn't that didn't necessitate um, lots of uh, laser fire mm-hmm. or um, karate, you know, karate chops, and you know, it was interesting, you know pre-warp civilization story but yeah Yeah. i think it would have been interesting to actually add if they had had to take it take this like if it had become the sacred relic to these people and they've had to take it but that was my only but otherwise i think it was i actually very it's so far my favorite episode of this season same here same here definitely yeah yeah Um, yeah like uh, i was like oh this is actually this is genuinely interesting like with all the other episodes i just kind of like my eyes glaze over most of the time and i'm just like okay yeah i mean okay the, another... the, the time bug one was fine um yeah. at least the concept behind it execution wasn't but, so but I don't, great I, I don't think it really delivered for me yeah. what i wanted to see in a yeah and like a time travel episode especially like one at the end of their c se- of their series like this would have been the perfect time to revisit a lot of like the most iconic moments from Discovery's and past. Char- and characters. Speaking of characters, characters, did you notice no Saru on this episode either? No I Saru, the that. last two. No Saru, the last two. Mm. Yeah. It is kind of weird to have him just, like, instantly pivot to, like, the um, 
the ambassador role in the final season, but no. it could just be, yeah, he's too busy with other projects or something. Yeah, and also done mm-hmm. with all the makeup and shit, so. Yeah. Well, checked out of that, which I, I totally get. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, I, I agree. This was best season, or best episode of the season so far. Um, at least the A plot. The B plot felt very tacked on and unimportant and, I don't know, not not preachy, but it was just like, I don't know, kind of kind of silly. Like, spending so much time on, like, a very nebulous spiritual concept on Star Trek. It also doesn't seem to be really have any sort of, like, it seems, it seemed like he came to just very vague conclusions mm-hmm. at the end that it's like, okay, this is, <laughs> just admit you don't know what you're doing, <laughs> what, you, yeah. what, you, what you're realizing here. No. And just like, it just came to some very vague conclusions that don't really feel satisfying or interesting in any way, shape or form. No. So it's just, it's basically no. the, basically the message, like you can believe things. And, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ultimately I'd give it like a six and a half probably. Um, Man, sounds I feel like I gave another episode like a six and a half so far, maybe a seven, but this is still probably the best one of the season for me so far. I, I enjoyed it the yeah. most, at least the A plot, like felt very Star Trek to me. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was a fun like dirty townspeople episode. Yeah, Dur- yeah, D- dirty town, but with like uh, perfect white veneers and mm-hmm. well, the, du- <laughs> and, uh, the dust don't touch your veneer, you know. Guts. You keep your mouth closed. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. just that's what they we invented. We've invented we invented dentistry, invented veneers and fake teeth. Mm-hmm. The dry lands have no mouthwash. <laughs> yeah, good for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, overall, not not too bad. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's about all I got to say on that. You got anything more to say? No. Uh, this episode's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool. You know what, you know what else was good? This episode of Soy Trek. Hells yeah. Yeah, yeah. And if you like Soy Trek, uh, please help support us. Go to patreon.com slash dumbidiotbs. That's patreon.com slash dumbidiotbs. Check out all the things you can get on all of our tiers. And uh, we appreciate your support, everyone who helps us out there. Uh, If you'd like to support us in other ways, please go like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast wherever you get podcasts. We really appreciate that. That helps us grow. And by helps us grow, I mean our penises. Gives us a real Mm heart on, and we like that. Yeah, yeah, and also make sure to visit the links in our in our uh, uh, social media bios because we got you know tickets for Slut, Slut Trek and mm-hmm. this month. Absolutely, you can come visit. And you can you're gonna have like a lot of merch there and stuff. So oh yeah, you can buy that. Oh yeah, I have a half a suitcase full of merch right now. I'm gonna fill it all the way the rest of the way up. I've got I made 48 shirts yesterday, and I'm waiting on another dozen or so. God damn. Oh boy. Should be fun. Yeah. Well, that'll that'll be that. So, uh yeah, I guess thanks for hanging with us, Soyagers. Be well, travel safe. And uh maybe check out Whistle Speak. It ain't too bad. No, yeah, thanks for trekking with us, Soy Boys, Girls and Ugly Beans. Hang dong. Hang dong. And shocker. And shocker. Soy 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 If you're out in Radio Land, come on here and give me a hand, give me a hand, give me a hand for a hand job, for a hand job. If you're out in Radio Land, come in here and touch me, man, right down there. I don't care, it's a hand job. Twist it like a knob, like a doorknob.